You glad you don't laugh that way? Good morning. Good to see you this morning. I have to say hi to somebody, so I'm a little behind. Are you wise? Do you know anybody who is really book smart? Who's as dumb as a bag of hammers? Anybody know somebody like that? Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Do you know somebody who... who why are you not raising your hand? Let's try it again. All right. Anybody know somebody who's really book smart, but it's not real smart? Okay, raise your hand. Okay. All right. If you didn't raise your hand, then it's you. And so, and by the way, for some of you, when you raise your hand, you really didn't need to look at that person. That was not nice. But I'm glad you're here this morning. My sister was at church last night. And she's a perfect laugh track. She thinks everything I say or do is funny. Which isn't always good, but it was actually fun last night. So Today we're going to talk about the gift of wisdom. And uh, let me give you the, in case you want to take a nap. By the way, good crowd today. I, and there's about a thousand people in the back. So hi back people. We're waving at the tables. If you ever want to sit back there and eat a donut, you know. And, uh, but keep an eye on those boys over there. They were messing around earlier. So Randy, you're in charge. Uh, anyway, but we're glad you're here this morning. It's been a fun week. We had uh, VBS. I'll have a video next week for you. Everything went phenomenally, and uh, it was a great week. Uh, it was even a boat fire next door. Lots of excitement, and um, it really was a neat week. The kids, one of the local um, uh, state farm agencies donated backpacks for all the kids, and they were spies, they had sunglasses, and it was a lot of fun. It was really cool. Listen, when it comes to wisdom, too often we chase the wrong things, and so if you're going to take a nap, listen, there's a verse I'm going to read a little bit later that says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. So the question for you today is, when's the last time that you asked God for wisdom? You know, too often when something happens that's difficult, we run to other people, or we watch Dr. Phil, or, and he says, how's that working for you? And, uh, or, we, or we seek out everything, and then finally when nothing works, then we go to God. How about if we reverse that and first say, God, would you give me wisdom? You know, years ago, I was thinking about people that chase the wrong thing. Years ago, when, when I was in school, I was a student that um, didn't really like school very much, I have to admit. I loved college, but I was so bored all the time in school. I just, I felt like my life was just boring in school. I, I'm not a, I don't like to sit still. I know that's a shocker to many of you. But I don't like, still don't like to sit still very often. People every once in a while come to me and they're like, when are you in the office? I'm like, when do you need me there? Because I'll go and visit you rather than have to just sit there and stare at the wall. But anyway, um, but I know pastors who are in the office a lot and play a lot of card games on their computer. But anyway, that's another story. But um, I, uh, so, so when I was in school, though, I sat near the back, and I'll never forget, they built a brand new building. And in the new building, one of the ballasts in the lights was going out. And so we had some testing and some other stuff, and the teacher was teaching some, and you know, and he was sitting at his desk, and we were out there, and we were bored. Well, I was sitting here, my friend Jim Hill, if you missed the story last week, Jim Hill is also in that story, and if you missed last week, all I can say to you is, born in the USA, look it up, and see, everybody laughs, so anyway, get online, you can go to YouTube and then ADD Pastor, you'll find it. Okay, and then anyway, and then my friend Dave Postmas was sitting over there at the other side. We were all sitting in the back, and this ballast was just buzzing that hum. And I realized while I was sitting there that I could match that hum myself without looking like I was. And so I was working on something, and I heard the hum, and I just started going. Mm. can even do it with a drink. So the teacher's back, back in the, up at his desk and <laughs> teacher gets up, starts walking down the aisle. As he gets close to me, I stop. And Jim Hill over here starts going. So the teacher comes walking over here. You can't see it on video. Sorry, I walked over here if you're looking. So the teacher then comes walking over here. As he gets over here, Jim stops. 
And Dave starts. When the teacher comes over to Dave, I started back. The teacher's walking. He cannot figure out where it's coming from because we were matching the ballast. So anytime we all stopped, you could still could hear just slightly. We were just amplifying it, you know. And, and I wanted to do the Boston, the, you know, Boston, the group, you know, the whammy bar. They go, right? So, but I didn't do it. But, I, but you know, you're out there. And so then the teacher, you knew it was driving him crazy because he went and he sat at his desk. And he'd work for a little bit and we'd be like, And he'd get up and he'd walk around again and he'd do the same thing. We'd, you know, it was awesome. And he's just walking around. And you could tell he was wanting to choke someone, but he didn't know who. He thought, and then he'd look up at the ballast. It was really funny because he walked between us and he'd look at the, because it was the same pitch. So it was just kind of, you know, it's kind of this thing. And I thought, you know, when I was thinking about chasing the wrong thing, I thought, you know, we do that so often in life. We, we think, you know, I'm going to figure life out. And so most of us, what we do when a problem comes along, instead of, um, um, when a problem comes along, instead of saying whip it, when a problem comes along, when a problem comes along, you know what we do? We worry about it. And we think somehow by worrying about it, we're going to fix it. And, and worrying, let me tell you what worry is. Worry is praying to yourself. About, usually about something you can do nothing about. So you worry about something, typically something that's in the future or something you're dealing with, and you're, all you're doing, and by the way, some people have said to me, well, worrying doesn't do a thing. No, 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 it does. It raises your blood pressure, and it gives you gray hair. And so, um, and if you have teenagers, you know, you'll notice I have a little gray hair. But, um, but that whole idea, so today what I want to look at is this whole idea of, listen, do you want to pursue God's wisdom? W- would your life be better if God poured his wisdom into you? What, what, how would your life change if, if sometimes when you were seeking an answer, if all of a sudden that God through his Holy Spirit just revealed to you how to deal with a teenager, how to deal with a neighbor, how to deal with an employee, how to deal with a person that's driving you crazy. Last night I said, think of one person who's driving you crazy. And later somebody came up to me and said, you know, it wasn't fair. You just said one. I had a group. You know, I'm like, okay, well, think of a group. We was driving, you know, and, and then begin to say, God, would you help me to have wisdom? So let's look at three things today if you're going to seek God's wisdom. Here's number one. Number one, God's wisdom is based on faith in God's power and not on yourself. Too often, your wisdom is short circuit, or God's wisdom is short circuit because we think we can handle stuff. That was true in the early church in Corinth. The early church in Corinth, remember, they prided themselves in knowing and in knowledge and, of course, the Greek philosophers and all that stuff. And also, pleasure was a big deal in the church, Not hopefully not in the church in Corinth, although it seeped in, but in the area of Corinth. Corinth was the Las Vegas of its day times ten. Everybody knew about Corinth. Corinth actually developed a word when you said something was carnal or something was really bad, you called it Corinthian. Um, not like Ricardo Montalban, Corinthian leather. But you just said Corinth, talking about that. All right, so here it is. We're going to pick it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. And here's what it says. This is Paul talking to the early church. Dear brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come preaching God's secret with fancy words or a show of human wisdom. Now, Paul was not a dummy. Paul was brilliant. Paul was trained by the finest Pharisee of his day. Actually, Gamaliel is known in the secular world as being a famous uh, Jewish person of that time. And so when Paul brags about his teacher, that was a big deal. And you were known by who taught you. So Paul had a lot he could have bragged about and he could have taught them. But instead he said, I didn't come opening a soda or showing you what you could do. I came, he said, preaching. I decided that while I was with you, I would forget about everything except Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. So when I came to you, I was weak and fearful and trembling. My teaching and preaching were not with words of human wisdom. And by the way, the the other teacher who everybody was saying, oh, we like him a better, Apollos, 
was. He was a very good speaker. He was very wise in the thing he said. But then he continues, and he said, I wasn't that persuade people, but with the proof of the power that the Spirit gives. This was so that your faith would be in God's power, not in human wisdom. Listen, there is nothing wrong with seeking knowledge. There's nothing wrong with studying. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. And that's talking about studying God's Word, understanding the Bible, understanding the, how the Bible works and what's going on in Scripture and how it applies to your life. All of that is good stuff. He's not saying that none of that's important. But he's talking about what do I put first? It's easy for us to focus on our skills and our gifts and the things we know how to do. Paul said, I put all of that aside so that you could see God's power. I wanted God's power to be above all. Is that what you're chasing in your life? Have you really said, God, I want your wisdom When's the last time you were talking to somebody who had a need and you took just a moment before you talked to them, and maybe they weren't a Christian, maybe it would have been awkward to say, let me pray with you a minute, you know. But, but maybe at least in your heart you whispered a prayer or something like this. God, give me wisdom to know how to answer them. Give, give me wisdom to know kind of how to, what they're dealing with. Because the truth is, in our own self, we can sometimes look at life the wrong way and see the wrong things. Listen to what Charles Stanley says about worldly versus godly wisdom. Worldly wisdom is the use of knowledge and information. Nothing wrong with that. Knowledge and information. It's based on human understanding and reasoning, but it's foolishness to the Lord. Now what does that mean? It means that God doesn't always see things the way we see things. Worldly wisdom says, value people that have money. Worldly wisdom says, value people that can help you. And I'll be honest, I've worked in a lot of churches. It's always sad to me to see church staff that focus on people who either have talents or gifts or have money, and all of a sudden they're drawn to them. I've heard about pastors who tend to favor. I heard about a church who when they chose committees, they chose committees based on the amount the person gave. That's not godly wisdom, and it's seeping into the church. It's one of the reasons I don't want to know what anybody gives. People say to me all the time, well, I, I don't want to know. Because I don't want ever for that worldly wisdom to seek in that says, hey, you favor the people who can do something for you and you leave the other one aside. That's not godly wisdom. Do you treat people better who are more like you? Do you treat people better who financially or in some way can help you? Or do you love the people around you? See, in the Bible, our wisdom is foolishness. God, listen... <laughs> God wanted to choose somebody to lead the people out of Egypt, so he got Moses, who was a stutterer. I don't know about you, but if I was looking for a pastor, it probably wouldn't be somebody that takes an hour to do a half-hour sermon. And you would never choose Paul. If I died tomorrow, if I died tomorrow and you had to choose a pastor, if Paul came and interviewed, you would never get Paul. Because you'd be like, number one, he's not that good. I heard a kid actually fell asleep and died. And Paul had to rise, you know, get him, raise him from the dead. But, but he was that bad of a speaker. He, he caused trouble everywhere he went. He was beaten so many times. I mean, this is the guy you want, the troublemaker? No, I don't think so. Let's get the other guy, the Apollos. You know, he's kind of a good... And, and Paul says to them, listen... God's wisdom and your wisdom are not always the same. We have to begin to view people and say, God, would you give me wisdom into what it is about them? How do you value them? How do you see them? Do you know God doesn't just put up with you? You know, sometimes in the back of our mind we think, you know, God, you kind of have to deal with me because I'm one of your kids. No, God finds joy in you. We're all his special needs children. Did you know that? Every one of us. You know, I have a special needs daughter, so I don't know how it is. I don't look at my special needs daughter and go, straighten up. I find joy in her. Guess what? God knows you don't have it all together. He knows you don't. He's not in heaven going, man, if they get it together, then I'd love them. No. The Bible says, while you were yet sinners, while you were in your worst point in life, that God looked at you and said, I love you. That's godly wisdom, not earthly wisdom. Earthly wisdom says you earn your way to God. You do enough good things and then God will like you. 
Godly wisdom says, Jesus sacrificed for you, gave everything for you. When you trust him, you take on God's righteousness. You don't deserve it. That's crazy talk. Even when I talk to people who aren't Christians, they don't get that. They look at me like, what? I thought God was in heaven with a baseball bat and with a scale and trying to figure out if my good outweighed my bad. I'm like, I don't know, but you wouldn't do so good if that was true. If karma was true, most of us would not have lived past 16. Just saying. Godly wisdom is the capacity to see things from the Father's viewpoint. Have you ever thought, how does God think about me? And have you looked biblically to see what that really is? See, some of us have been taught wrong our whole lives that God's mad at you. He's not mad at you. That God's just waiting for you to mess up. He's not. He's rooting for you. He's cheering for you. There's tons of verses. Hebrews is full of those verses that says, God and the angels are in heaven going, come on! And when you fall down, they don't go, <laughs> They're cheering for you. They're hoping another Christian comes and helps you up. It's the capacity to see things from the Father's viewpoint, listen, and respond according to scriptural principles. But here's the deal. You cannot respond according to scriptural principles if you don't know the Bible. So spend time every day in God's Word. I'm getting there. Number two, it comes from His Spirit. Godly wisdom comes from His Spirit. Now I want to show you some smart people. Here's the first one. Einstein. We use Einstein as an insult now. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Well, he's some kind of Einstein. Right? You know, that's, that's when you know somebody's super smart because when you can use it as an insult. But this is not my favorite picture of Einstein. This is, and this is not Photoshop. It's an actual picture he was messing around. And every English teacher I know has that picture on their wall with some English statement under it. Did you know that, Mike? All right, next one. We actually put his name because you've never seen a picture of him. I don't know anybody who has an Aristotle picture hanging on their wall. I know people who have the little things, the little statues on their piano, and they don't even know who those are. Uh, one of these is Bach. I'm not sure. The other one's Beethoven. I don't know. They just look cool on the piano, right? You go to somebody's house, they got the... All right, so that's Aristotle, all right? And this is Socrates by Bill and Ted. His name is Socrates. By the way, we, we looked hard, and, and I don't know how we found this, but we found a video of Socrates, so we're going to show it to you now. We are. It's just the wind, dude. Just. Wind. Dude. You didn't know we had the capacity to get videos like that, did you? And then last but not least, our, almost, our, our famous fake smart person, Sheldon. Who's one lab accident away from being a supervillain? Right there, he's trying to use his mind to. <laughs> Wisdom comes from God's Spirit. As smart as all those people are, they weren't always smart when it came to real life. By the way, Solomon is considered wise. Can I tell you something? He was really dumb when it came to a lot of things. Because of Solomon, the kingdom was split. And I don't have time to go into all that. But Solomon said some wise things. But honestly, Solomon was not always wise, and especially in how he dealt with his many wives. That's an understatement. Many. Plethora of wives and children. Listen to what Paul said. But God has shown us these things through the Spirit, verse 10. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep secrets of God. So the idea is that the Holy Spirit can look in your heart and even tell you what's going on with you. The Holy Spirit sees beyond what you even see. Sometimes you don't know why you're... You ever get irritated and you don't even know why you're irritated? You wake up in the morning and you're like... Arr! And then you're like, why am I irritated? And you don't even know. And if you're married, that's the deal with you. You're looking at your spouse you're like... What are you mad about? And they go, I don't know. Just grumpy. I don't know. Especially guys. We don't even care. We're like, I don't know. I'm just irritated. I'm going for a walk. Whatever, right? So it says, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep secrets of God. Who knows the thoughts that another person has? So, man, when you're thinking, I don't understand my wife. Yeah, there it is right there. they got a verse for you. you that could be on your fridge. Who knows the thoughts another person has? And then it goes, only a person's spirit that lives within them knows their thoughts. So I want you to take a minute. I want you to smile at the person next to you, behind you, around you. Go ahead, take a moment. You can say hi. Say hi. Do that for a second. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. 
by God. Now I want you to know this morning that with, with about 100 people in here more or less, the, the chance that a couple that's here this morning had a fight on the way here is pretty high. And just now in front of you, they looked at each other and went, hi. And inside they're thinking, you just wait till we leave here. <laughs> now if you have teenagers or children who've misbehaved in the store, you've made that face before. Right? They're in the store. You got them in the cart. They're reaching out and grabbing stuff. They're screaming. And you're looking at them going... <laughs> right? Now, I could probably figure out your thoughts from that one. But the truth is, sometimes we don't even know why we feel the way we do. Sometimes we don't under, we're not in touch with why. You know, why do I respond that way? Why do I treat people this way? Why does this irritate me? But the Spirit knows. And God's Spirit, that's the reason we need to say, God, would you fill me with your Spirit? Would you show me the truth? It is the same with God. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we didn't receive the spirit of the world, but we receive the spirit that is from God so that we can know all that God has given us. Jesus actually said after he left, we would be blessed because the Holy Spirit in our heart would reveal things to us. This is one of the reasons, and I don't know the last time. When's the last time you prayed, God, would you fill me with your spirit? God, would you fill me with your spirit? Would you give me wisdom from your spirit? When's the last time that you prayed that? Usually what we're praying is, God, fix this, fix that person, <laughs> fix that situation. When's the last time you said, God, give me wisdom, fill me with your spirit, help me respond properly because of your spirit in me. And we speak about these things not with words taught us by human wisdom, which Paul had a lot of, but with words taught us by the spirit. And so we explain spiritual truths to spiritual people. Now let me give you the key to these verses, and that's this. In order to gain God's wisdom, you have to get still. Now I'm Mr. ADD. I don't know that anybody tops distraction in this room compared to me, but maybe you do. I want you to know it is a discipline to learn to get still. Now some of you are not ADD, so outwardly you look really still, but I know. Some of you are like ducks in your head, right? And in your head, outwardly you're... But in your head, you're like that duck, right? And even though you're sitting here calmly in the back of your mind, you're worried about 45 different things. Yes, Pastor, I'm listening. I should have taken something out for lunch. Right? Or whatever you're thinking of. Or what am I going to do tomorrow? Or I got to meet, oh, that's so and so. Oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to, right? And outwardly, but inwardly, so you go to the doctor and they're like, uh, Mr. Brookins, your blood pressure is a little high. What's going on? I don't know. <laughs> no idea, right? You know, because inwardly we're dealing with stuff. And we're not taking it to God. You've got, you and I, and it over and over in Scripture, it talks about the Holy Spirit being in the still, small voice. You and I have to spend time getting still, putting our phone away, turning off the TV, taking time to chill out, to get our Bible out, to spend some time reading God's Word and saying, God, speak to my heart as I read. If you've never had a quiet time, listen, there's a ton of resources. There's Daily Bread. We, we have them on the table every few months when they're new. There's also an app. I have the Daily Bread app on my phone. It was 99 cents like three years ago when I bought it. And it's, they keep giving me a new one every month. There's the Version Bible. You can get a Bible. We have Bibles on the table. And start in the book of Matthew and just read every day. Read a story. They're, they're broken up. into So just read a story and say, God, speak to my heart about this. And you'd be surprised how day after day, year after year, the wisdom from Scripture will pour into your heart. By the way, if you're going through a really rough patch in life, it's great to read Psalms and to see how David would get so overwhelmed with life sometimes, he would just be crying out to God. And then he would refocus on God. Spend time getting still. When was the last time that you got still, that you got away? Maybe you went out on the water and just took time to pray. Listen, the best part of your prayer life, when you start to pray, take time first to be thankful. God, thank you. And, and begin to give thanks to God. And that'll change, that alone will change your heart and your attitude. It'll slow you down. 
And then spend time praying for the people closest to you, your family, your friends, your neighbors. Pray for them. And then pray for people in the church. Make sure you throw your pastor in there. And say, God, we're... And as you begin to pray for him, you know what God does? He starts to reveal to you things to do. How to love people. Maybe if you said something that you need to go and apologize to somebody. You know, those, I don't like those parts. And you've got to make things right. Every time you listen to God's voice, though, I want to caution you, it needs to line up with His Word. If you want a very simple verse that you can, you can put down, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, when you're listening to God's voice, it should always line up with the Spirit. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. So if you're praying and you're like, God told me to kill the pastor, I want to tell you, that's not God. Okay, I'm just telling you ahead of time. It's not. If you think, well, i got to go straighten somebody out, and that's your attitude, and you're gritting your teeth, that's not God. If you're having a hard time forgiving somebody, or you're refusing to forgive them, that's not God. I feel like that's a redneck. Okay, but anyway, that's another one. James 1.5 says this. You might not be trusting God. Yeah. All right. James 1.5 says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should, what's the next word? Ask. Ask. When's the last time you asked God for wisdom? Ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. Isn't that awesome? He gives to you. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, you're not good enough to get wisdom. And then it says, and it'll be given to you. Some of us think somehow we have to earn our way for God's favor. He loves you. You don't always get it right. You, you mess up. You fall down. But God's attitude when you fall down is not, I'm going to get you. God's attitude is, get up. Do you realize that the whole Bible is about redemption? All of Scripture is about people who blew it, who God restored and fixed. That's your story. There's more hurts in this world for each one of us. Every one of us has hurts. Things that have been poured into our lives. Things that came into our lives that we didn't want. God wants to use that very hurt to help you, to help other people. What you feel like might be your downfall may be the thing that God uses to put wisdom into you to then be a blessing to somebody else. Number three, God's wisdom accepts truth from God. When I taught school, I always wanted the kids to kind of preview, and I did different ways to teach them before the test. And one of the things I would do, the kids would come in about two days before the test, and I'd go, time for a pop quiz, and they would make the noise that you're going to make right now? Aww. Pretty good, not bad at all. And then I would give them an impossible quiz, to dream the impossible quiz. And I would hand it out, I would hand out the impossible quiz, and to fly in the impossible goal. That's from Manuel La Mancha, by the way, it's a really bad version, but there you go. And so I'm passing out the quiz, and I made it impossible, and the kids would get the quiz, and they would instantly hate me. It was amazing. I went from the favorite teacher of the year to, Arr! they're scowling. They're thinking bad thoughts, evil thoughts, die, die, die. Okay, so all this stuff, and they're looking at me, and they're looking at the quiz, and I start hearing this noise. There's always one, one really dumb kid that, boom, and you hear the desk go, boom. You're thinking, well, I don't know why you do that. Anyway, so all this is happening, and the kids are all struggling. And the real smart kid's mad at me, too. I can't believe you. I'm going to get a C. Never gotten a C in my life. And behind me was a screen, and behind that was a chalkboard. Years ago, they used to use something called chalk before dry erase markers. And most math teachers were covered with it, hand to foot. And if a math teacher clapped, chalk went everywhere. Math teachers breathed chalk. Many of them are dying from chalk disease. Anyway, so, so I would raise up the screen. And behind there was a chalkboard. And on that chalkboard was every answer. The smart kid didn't look up. It was the kid like me who was sitting out in the thing that went, Hey! Whoa! And children who were always the ones going, Mr. B, you're going too fast, who typically wrote like this. Now they were writing like, and they come walking up. And they're smiling. Now I'm their favorite teacher. Hey, Mr. B, they plop it on the desk. And the smart kid looks up and he sees them put it and he's thinking, they didn't even fill it out. They must have not even. 
And you look, the smart kid's still struggling. And then other kids start getting up. And the smart kid starts thinking, what are they doing? Looks up at the board and goes, oh! <laughs> Mr. B, I want you to know I had two of those right before I ever saw the board. <laughs> Good job there, Doofus. There you go. All right, so. Listen. Most of us are struggling. Most of the things we're struggling with, if we got our Bibles out and read the Bible, we would get a principle from Scripture that would help us with most of life. Most all of the answers and the principles are in there of how to live. Things to do, things not to do. Love your neighbor. That's pretty broad. But no, I want to be spiteful and peel their yard out on the way home. It's, you know, scriptural principles will change your life. Paul said, the person that doesn't have the Spirit does not accept the truths that come from the Spirit of God. That person thinks they're foolish and can't understand them because they can only be judged by the truth of the Spirit. The spiritual person is able to judge all things, but no one can judge him. I don't have time to go into that. I wish I did. The Scripture says, who has known the mind of the Lord, who's been able to teach him, but we have the mind of Christ. Let me give you one big application for this. When you're witnessing to somebody who does not believe the Bible, don't. Don't think in your mind that they're going to believe what you believe. They don't. So how do you deal with them? You have to pray for wisdom. They're not going to always understand. They don't have the same belief systems. And what happens all the time with Christians, and it's so sad to me, when somebody doesn't see your viewpoint the way that you think they ought to see it, because you've read the Bible and you know what it says, and they look at you like you're crazy, Christians tend to get mad and say things like, well, if I'm right and you're wrong, you're going to hell. Boy, that's so motivational. And they put things on their sign, get right or get left, eternity, smoking or non-smoking, right? All that stuff that they put. And that's not convincing anybody of the gospel. So what do you do? You pray and you say, God, would you help me to be a witness to them? Help me to know what to say. So when I'm dealing with people, listen, there's times they ask me questions. What about the dinosaurs? And I go, I don't know. What about this? I don't know. But here's what I know. At some point, they have to go back, and whether they believe in evolution or whatever, if they don't believe in God at all, they have to go back and they have to put their faith in something. So they may have to put their faith in the fact that they think chemicals just appeared and everything just came and we were ooze and then just, you know, we became this and that and then the other and crawled out of the sea and primordial ooze and blah, 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 you know, all the stuff that they... And I go, listen, you have to choose. You've put your faith in science. Congratulations, I put my faith in God. It's up to you. I think your faith is actually stronger. And I've had people who aren't Christians look at me like, yeah, it is. I'm like... Last night we had a teacher at our school years ago was asking me a lot of those questions. And I did said just what I said to you. I don't always know the answer, but here's what I know. You've got to put your faith somewhere. And you've got to decide. And I remember he came to me a few months after that and he said, you know what? I think you're right. I think there's a God. And I think Jesus is his son. And he gave his life to Christ. I was able to baptize him a few years later. It was awesome. But you have to let God do that. Don't think that you're in charge of the Holy Spirit. You're not other people's Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit convict them. It's not your job. Hebrews 4 talks about God's Word. The Word of God is living, active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything's uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. When you read God's Word, He convicts your heart. When you read God's Word, He knows your motivation. Sometimes you think you're getting it all right, and you read something in the Bible, and you go, oh. He knows your heart. He knows your heart. Remember, God's wisdom is based on faith. Don't chase after your own wisdom. Say, God, through faith, would you help me? It comes from His Spirit. But you and I have to accept His truth. And say, God, would you put your truth in my life? Would you give me wisdom as I read your word? And he, the Bible says, will do it. If you're here today, I never want you to leave without the opportunity to give your life to Christ. Maybe like that friend that I witnessed to, you don't know what your faith is in. I want to encourage you, after the service, we don't do a formal invitation, but after the service, I'd be glad to talk to you about what it means to give your life, to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. To say, God, I know I blow it, I know I mess up, but I surrender my life to you. Maybe you're here today, and as I talked about wisdom, you have a big something going on in your life that you don't know what to do. I want to encourage you during this next time, just say, God, would you give me wisdom in this area? Give me wisdom in this area. And call on him. The Bible says he'll never turn down that prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and your power. Lord, I thank you for wisdom that comes from you. 
Father, I thank you that you can use anyone because of your wisdom, not because of our knowledge or even our ability, but it's from your spirit. Father, I pray that we as a church would pray for the fullness of your spirit, the power that comes from you, so that we can be wise, especially in how we deal with outsiders, people who don't know you. 